Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of our multi-part webinar series focused on remote PI planning. My name is Laura Richardson, and with me today are two principal consultants from Applied Frameworks, Kevin Rosengren and John Mulligan. For at least the next few months, companies cannot schedule face-to-face -face collaboration, but we all feel some degree of pressure to carry on in spite of the challenges. The impulse to hold off or delay planning has the risk of making a recovery more difficult. And let's face it, the need to work remotely will return, whether it be due to COVID-19 or other factors. Let me turn this over to Kevin and John now, and uh, let's talk a little bit more about what this means for remote PI planning. So John, when we think about the elements of, of a remote planning, kind of we, we talked earlier about how to schedule and plan, what runway looks like, what logistics, what tools. You wanna to kick us off and talk a little bit about um, where we're gonna go here? Yeah, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time about talking what it takes to actually plan a PI planning session in advance, um, especially planning for one virtually, especially if you've never done one before. Um, and I'll give you a little background. I, I've worked at Anthem for many years and the first PI planning that we did at Anthem, we did remotely because they weren't convinced that scaled agile was the way to go for one. Two, there was budgetary concerns. And then three, many of the people who work in Anthem actually work from home already. It was kind of a culture that everybody was used to working from home. So we did this PI planning. So my experience has been that, you know, in the four years I worked there, that every other PI planning session would be remote. So I come to it with some experience. And then as it turns out this week, I did another virtual PI planning session with one of my clients. Um, and they are brand new. This was their first PI planning session they've ever done. Um, and they were breaking their teams out and it was, um, it was an interesting experience for them. There's some good lessons learned that we'll talk about from, the, from their first experience. But um, there's a lot of things to be talked, we're gonna talk about here about the timelines, what logistics do you have to have? What are some of the obstacles you have to overcome from a tools perspective? And how do you collaborate given that you can't just stand up and walk to the table next to you to talk to other people? So that's kind of where we're gonna go with that. Um, so what we recognize is that everything you do virtually takes a little bit longer. Um, the normal PI planning session is typically two days. Uh, if you look at the Scaled Agile website, they kind of give you that very detailed plan, and it's two long days. Um, sometimes I've seen PI plan planning two and a half days if you maybe throw in an expect and adapt session at the beginning, that sort of thing. But we're recognizing that it takes a little bit longer. The team I was on right now, just that we did this week, there was a debate and they decided they wanted to do it on one day. And then overwhelmingly, the retrospective came back and said, gosh, we really should have done this in two days. Um, and so a one day schedule was, would have been better on a two day. A normal two day schedule, we're thinking three or four days. So, um, and with that, we've got to uh, think about how are you gonna do all your presentations? Um, how do you do logistics with respect to your Zooms, your breakouts, you're gonna have video conferencing, audio conferencing different types like that. How do you do your presentations and, and facilitate the um, coordination? So one of the things that we found is exactly what we're doing right here, where Laura, for example, is helping drive the Zoom meeting and monitoring our chat and helping to make sure that we've got logistics on the back end while Kevin and I are doing some of the presentations. And having that extra person helping to run logistics, as it turns out, is one of the really, really helpful things that we've learned in doing remote collaboration. Um, and then the other thing, of course, in the last poll we talked about, Extraordinary times, and you know, Kevin mentioned it, a lot of people are parents, and it turns out now school teachers and uh, daycare providers and things like that. Or, and I know in Kevin's situation, his wife oftentimes sits in the same room he does and has conference calls. So it's sometimes a challenge when you have somebody else in the, in the house doing the work as well. So staying engaged and staying quiet. So those are some of the things we've learned. Um, if you wanna go on the next slide there, Laura. Well, I was going to say, John, one of the yeah. things that uh, we found really helpful as we've moved our online training, uh, sorry, our in-person training online is to ensure that we're, we're taking these scheduled breaks. Yes. What, what have you found? It, it, we've played around. We, 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 we threw up here a 45-15 rule uh, for some of the things we've done. What have you seen work well and what are the, some of the risks to those things? Yeah, I think it is definitely important to take the breaks. Um, people have trouble staying focused while sitting in front of a laptop and being on video for those periods of time. So the 45, 15 is you know, good, 50, 10, that sort of thing. Um, th the challenge is getting people back from the break on time. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can get everybody, as I heard a joke one time where somebody said, all right, everybody take five, make sure you're back in 15 minutes. 
<laughs> so <laughs> that's right. Sort of. Well, you know, the same thing. Um, and you know, know one getting... thing that one thing that we <laughs> what we found is don't don't have those breaks on exact um, uh, exact times because people will try and squeeze in that phone call mm -hmm. in that very minor that very minor uh, that little small window. So vary it up a little bit as you're thinking about your your day, but do make right. sure you have those frequent breaks. As you go well, along. and that, it's so funny. I, I talk about the last thing that's down there, the bandwidth issues. That's another thing. It's just, you know, everybody, if you've got, if you're at home and your spouse is working and your, you know, kids are playing video games and, you know, you recognize that your bandwidth might get sucked down. And, or if you happen to live, I had a friend that lived out in the country. We used to jokingly refer to her internet as the chicken internet because she did actually have chickens on her farm. And so she would always have issues with, you know, things dropping and that sort of thing. And we'd be like, well, there she went, chicken internet down again. So, um, just recognize that not everybody is going to be in a position where they're going to have high speed internet access all the time. And so you have to be able to recognize that some people might just actually have to dial in on the landline or on their cell phone or that sort of thing. You may drop the visuals. Um, you know, sometimes it even takes bandwidth to create this little virtual background by, behind me. And so just, you know, recognize that people are doing the best they can. So, um, so what we've put together here is kind of what is the timeline to prepare for a virtual PI planning session. And obviously you're gonna plan for any PI planning session, but we've just kind of looked at this and broken down some of the key things. Um, and we've broken them into a couple different areas. Um, the orange ones at the bottom are more like release train engineer um, activities and the ones at the top are more related to kind of your product folks, um, the team and the product preparation. And um, so some of the key things is getting the calendar invites out there, planning the logistics, um, testing your logistics, and that's an, a key thing. If you haven't done large-scale Zoom meetings before, you're going to want to make sure that you've got those tested. Um, we've also, if you've got some sort of a, let's say, a confluence or some sort of a prep page, making sure that that is published and people have a chance to look at all of the information that you have in advance. They're looking at the agenda. They're looking at the breakout times. You've published all the links. Um, you know, if, if you have a separate Zoom meeting, for example, for every single one of your uh, teams, Make sure that that's published in advance and you've tested it to make sure that's working properly. Um, and then um, and then the tools too. So some people may not have used the tools. So um, this team I'm working with, they actually did a mock PI planning session um, about two weeks ago. You know, it lasted like an hour, but it was a mock PI planning session just to be able to get everybody online and check out the tools and understand how people were doing it. So if you've never done a virtual one, doing some sort of a mock is frankly not a bad plan to do. That, um, that is that is huge, John, because what we have found is a lot of these tools are new to people. And so simple things like establishing accounts or signing into Miro or Mural or Weave or something like that um, takes time. And if you if you don't if you don't have an orientation ahead of your PI planning, you're going to waste some very valuable time with uh, I can't sign in. How do I navigate? So we've actually constructed orientation sessions that allow for just a little bit of interaction with the tools, uh, whatever tools you use, whatever whiteboarding, shared collaboration, whiteboarding space tool you use so that people can make sure they can log in, make sure they access it. They can play around with it as sort of a sandbox, uh, mm -hmm. but also um, be able to operate and navigate within it, be it some of the tools or some of the, some of the features in there. So I think that's a really important thing, uh, John, is to make sure that there is a little bit of a orientation session for folks who are new uh, to remote PI planning and to do that in a way that allows them to orientate and, and, and operate with the tools you're using just to make yeah. that first hour of that first day as valuable as the rest of the time. Yeah, and one of the things, and actually, Laura, if you want to go to the next slide, because I think we have a couple things highlighted that I did want to talk about. The, the, the one right there, we talked about collaboration, but the backlog refinement one was definitely a key lesson that we learned this week. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I was telling you that this particular team is fairly new to the whole Agile process. So they had been doing, they had not been doing team-based refinement. They had been, they're actually, even within their JIRA process, it was very waterfall. It was like, you know, one person writes the story and they literally change the status of JIRA to hand it to the next person who changes the status to hand it to the next person. So they had not really done a lot of team collaboration, but in the last couple of weeks, they've begun to do it, sort of, I call it the right way. And unfortunately, they didn't really finish. So they got into PI planning and had a situation where they had to spend a little bit of their uh, collaboration time um, actually spending time doing more of the refinement. So 
very, very critical that you've got as much of your backlog refinement done as you can before you get there. So yeah. um, and, and yeah. refinement takes longer in distance that you can't just jump to a whiteboard and sketch out how you might mm -hmm. attack a particular story. So yeah, starting that refinement as soon as possible to make sure that you've got enough time from between time you start and time you go in to have good refined uh, features and, and, and epics and stories. Right, right. So it, uh, um, I know we're jumping around a little bit here, but gosh, when we were trying to figure out what are we going to talk about, there were so many things. I just wanted to underscore one thing that, that Kevin, you had mentioned earlier about the, the, the dry run. So a couple people had asked me about, well, how do you, what are some of the tips or what do you do to keep people engaged and make sure that they're fully participating? Actually, that dry run is the time that you can spend on uh, kind of coming up with working agreements, even if they're um, implicit working agreements. For example, um, one thing is to yeah. ask everyone to turn their video camera on and let them know that video will be on for the PI planning sessions. And it makes a massive difference um, in terms of somebody's engagement, whether they think you can see them or not. And, yeah. and actually, it's not even that people don't want to be engaged. It's just, it's just a thing that happens to you, right, when you know that people, you're like making eye contact with people. You can set that expectation at the dry run so that people have time to get their laundry out from behind them and make their space look good or practice with the virtual background if, you know, if they don't want to do the other side of things. So anything that, that you want to make sure that you set is sort of like the ground rules or the working mm -hmm. agreements, that's another reason to have this dry run. That's your time. Yeah. To set. yeah. Hit those working agreements on the orientation. We found that to be very effective because it does just put people's mindset in the right, in the right place to hit the ground running day one. Good. Ready for the next slide? Yes, please. There you go. Yeah. So on this one, a couple of things I want to point out. There are many teams or companies in which Scrum Masters actually are split across multiple teams. And um, I've seen that at com many companies I've worked at. And so, but when you find yourself in a virtual situation, you can literally only be in one place at one time virtually. And so... Um, you have to find somebody who can facilitate a lot of these things. So if a scrum master has got is split across two teams, make sure you're thinking in advance, well, who's going to, who's going to be the person that's running it. So in certain situations, you know, maybe your product owner has a zoom meeting. And so the product owner is the one that's running the zoom meetings on, and then the scrum master can actually jump back and forth. So they're not using the scrum masters uh, zoom meeting because, you know, if the scrum master zoom meeting is being used and then they drop out of it to go to the other one, there's a chance that they could drop it for everybody if they don't properly hand over the hand over the uh, controls to somebody. So different things like that are some of the things that you want to want to look at. Um, we talked about sort of a tool lead. So as Laura is kind of being today our, our tool lead. Um, the other challenge, of course, is with PI planning. You know, you want to have your leadership team who's normally walking around the room and chatting with each of the teams and maybe scoring their PI objectives, that sort of thing. You're going to want to make sure that you've scheduled those a little bit more formally so that you have a designated time that you expect these people are going to jump into your room and have those conversations, your virtual room and have those conversations. Um, and that's one of the reasons you're going to want to make sure you have things published on some sort of a wiki confluence, whatever you happen to have so that your leadership team can actually jump from room to room to room and actually visit you, you know, when it's appropriate. Um, time boxes are obviously important as with everything we do in agile, you know, we try to monitor the time boxes, but also recognize that, you know, you, sometimes you're going to have to, you know, adjust certain things as, as things change. And that course, recognizing obviously that you're going to want to put these extra breaks in because people can't always be um, focused all the time or they have, as Laura pointed out, the, the dryer went off and they got to take the laundry out. Yeah. So whatever happens to be going on, you know, you've got to be able to look, adjust those things accordingly. John, do you see the RTE playing this sort of planning lead role for the PI plan? Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And the other thing, you know, you're going to have to do all the stuff that you would normally do um, if you're going to have some sort of a scrum of scrums scenario, um, you know, where the scrum masters can jump out of their particular teams and come do their scrum of scrums, um, you know, at the end of the first day, or might be the end of the second day, depending on how you look at it, you know, when you have your, your leadership team meeting for planning and adjustments, all those things, you know, should still be in place, but, you know, you just want to do them a little bit more virtually. Yeah. Yeah, and one also, of the, the things I wanted to add in here, because people are asking about some of the um, like Microsoft Teams or Skype, and obviously we're using Zoom here, and they're asking about um, both handling breakout rooms and if we have experience with those. You know, before we started this whole, you know, forced online 
I was really excited about the breakout rooms in Zoom as being a way to kind of manage the scatter gather nature of what a PI planning session looks like. And um, I, I think I've changed my mind a little bit on that over the course of the last couple of months where I feel like these um, kind of designated breakout rooms that people have are really great for our education purposes, right? When we have a classroom of say 20, 25 people, it's really nice to be able to say, okay, go into your work groups as if you have your round tables in a, you know, in-person class. And we know what those work groups are and we can send people off for 15 minutes and then have them come back. And for education, I think it's great. I actually now think it's better to have a separate Zoom link for every team so that um, a, an RTE or a, a leader or even somebody who needs to, to pop out and have that conversation around a dependency can say, oh, I'm in you know, team one Zoom, but I'm going to go to team two Zoom group so that you know, I can have a conversation there. And, and it supports more of this ad hoc um, I, I guess moving around of people yeah. when you have a designated or designated Zoom link for every team. And I'd even use the analogy of the push versus pull because Laura, in your example, if you're teaching a class and you want to have five people into one group because that's their virtual table, you have to assign them to that table. Once they're in there, they can't unassign themselves and change tables. So yes. if you want people to have the flexibility to be able to move between rooms, you actually have to have separate Zooms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I have found a lot of value in, in teams that have already been broken out into their own Zoom um, call. They can further break out and do some planning, right? So maybe two folks need to go in and have a conversation about how to architect something or how to achieve something. Hey, that's great. And yeah. they, can, they can break off. And I think that's a good reason for having multiple Zooms as an example, and I'm using Zoom sort of ubiquitously these days, right? Zooming has turned into a, a noun and a verb, right? Um, but uh, allowing you to have those team level breakouts is very powerful. And if you structure it the right way, it allow you to bop between um, different spaces. And I think, John, you're gonna talk a little bit about some of the structures of the collaboration tools and how to, how to manage that effectively. Yeah, we've got some of that uh, closer to the end. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, all right. So here's just what we kind of came up with as a four day PI planning session. It incorporates everything that you would normally see in a two day PI planning session, just broken out over four days. And the reason we chose four days is because we don't want everybody to be in a virtual session for eight hours a day. And, you know, the other interesting thing about virtual sessions and the one that I was on this particular week, as I mentioned, and as you know, Sarah Ben, she's from London. So we had people on the team from London, but we also had people on the team from India and the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. So East and West Coast, you get a three hour time difference. The UK is like five hours ahead of the East Coast. And then, you know, India is eight and a half or whatever ahead of the East Coast. And so that means they're literally on the other side of the world from the West Coast of the United States. So trying to figure out, trying to do an eight hour PI planning session with that many time zones is virtually impossible because some people up at three o'clock in the morning. So if you break it out over two days or four days, you actually can find a few more hours that you have overlap. And uh, sorry, I'm moving around. My 100 pound laboratory retriever decided he wants to get under my desk and both of us don't fit at the same time. Um, all right, so um, yeah, the, the, the issues of working from home. Um, yeah, so the time zone differences are, you know, are definitely critical. And frankly, having shorter periods of time where you can get people involved actually is a, a much better thing. So um, yeah. All right, so here's the other thing. So synchronization. So, you know, obviously you've got to be checking in with people. Normally in a PI planning session, that's easy. You're going to stand up, you're going to walk around the room, talk to other, other people, maybe have lunch with them, that sort of thing. So as Kevin mentioned earlier on, the whole hallway conversation just does not exist. So you really have to, that's another reason, frankly, to have some of those 15 minute breaks every once in a while is it does actually allow people you know, more than just to take the clothes out of the dryer thing, but it does allow a couple extra opportunities for people to maybe make a phone call, have an IM chat with somebody else, um, things like that. So that's one thing. But um, also going through, the, we're talking about some checklists and all. So what I've seen helpful sometimes that, for example, the Scrum of Scrums is basically having a very simple checklist that the Scrum Masters can then come in and be like, just so they don't forget anything, to be honest. Um, so we've got you can see the list there. I'm not going to read them all to you, but um, it's just a, a simple checklist to be able to start thinking about, have I done all these things? And if not, 
you know, what do I need to do to make sure it's, that's just happening? So, you know, I look at this, the third from the bottom, on track for completing a draft plan. I recognize a lot of people sometimes, they skip that, not skip it, but they forget about that. They get so involved in looking at stories and, and maybe slotting them into future sprints, things like that. And they don't really think about, oh, well, where am I? And am I meeting the timeline or have I started to create my program objectives? And have I identified all my risks? And have I talked to the other teams about the risks? So I know about them, but do they know about them? Um, so it's a little bit more challenging if you can't, as I said, if you can't walk around across the room. So um, those are some of the things that we could really look at from a checklist perspective to really just keep things top of mind for Scrum Masters and the rest of the team. So, so John, I've, I've got a question about how you um, maybe leverage the different channels of communication to support the review of the checklist, right? So obviously you can have um, uh, uh, teams with their Zoom channels and there's the chat integrated with that, and I would imagine that's for the team discussions to happen, you know, asynchronously and things like that. Are, are you also recommending that people layer on something like the, um, you know, chat that's available in Microsoft Teams or with, um, you know, one of the other chat, you know, whatever you use for your internal kind of instant messaging. But do you use that as kind of the back channel check-in with people on top of it? Or talk to me about the layers of yeah. Of well, what I've seen, what I've seen a lot of teams do sometimes if they have Confluence or some sort of a wiki tool like that is we actually will put those questions on the wiki and then we'll have a series of checks, you know, it might be the as you know, if on that slide couple, well, if you go back to the previous slide just for just a second. Um, so you've got those three, those three team breakouts right so sometime during those team breakouts, you know, you might have your scrum or scrums and so let's say that you have three of the scrum or scrums one for each day you might have that series of checklists and you might have three different columns for every or a column for every one of the teams. And so they come in and it just gives them a visual representation. They can answer yes or no to some of those questions. And if the answer is no, it's, it's not like that's a bad thing necessarily. It's just a reminder that, well, maybe you ought to start looking at this, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, yeah. Oh, and as far as that, but yeah, I mean, what I've seen too, especially for scrum of scrums, Oftentimes that's the release train engineer zoom or virtual call that you, know, you jump out of your own you go to that and then you use that collaboration tool. Um, but everybody shows up at the same time and they've got that visual checklist so they can see and it's not like um, You know, it's not like you're going on report if it doesn't you don't have yeses in every column, but it's just a reminder of what you, you know, should be doing That virtual checklist, I think is really important as we are all distributed to focus on. Okay, no kidding. Here's the things that we are aiming for at each of these check ins. So use the checklist, knock it out, and it gets in the habit so that each time you get together, you're very quickly and efficiently ensuring that you're syncing as fast as possible because there are small snippets of time. Great. Are you ready for a poll, Laura? Uh, sure. All right. So the next question I want to do is around um, tools. We're going to talk a little bit more about tools. And so I thought the first thing I, I would like to know is of the people on the call, what agile tools are you using? And by the way, John and I, when we tried to come up with our list here, we're limited to 10. And we then started talking about, is that really an agile tool or is that something else? And we're like, you know what, let's not even discuss it. Let's put it out there and see what people say. And if it's not technically an agile tool, it's okay. We'll just, so we have two parts to this but, uh, that we're kind of curious about. All right, so. Was this a, uh, could, could you do, is this a multi-select one here, Laura? Yep, multi-select. So yeah, so feel free to. And we've got almost uh, a little more than half the people have replied so far. So we're, I'll, I'll share the results in just a second. But um, I'm not surprised. It looks like, um, you know, a lot of JIRA Confluence um, check boxes there. Uh, Microsoft Teams, Miro, um, we like Miro a lot. Um, at, at applied framework. So let's see. No go to meeting, no blue jeans yet. Oh, it was Slack was missing. We, we even use oh, Slack. You know what? I didn't put Slack on <laughs> that. But yeah, I mean, and by the way, if, if your tool that you use or you like isn't there, just stick it into chat because then the other folks on the call would also like to know like what are Yeah, the, for are yeah, for all those others would love to know what those are. Right. And then the um, I'll, I'll go ahead and end this one and um, share the results of that. 
Yeah, so, uh, and also if you have any recommendations of things that you've used that you would never use again, I'm sure everyone would appreciate knowing what that is as well. Um, so both positive experiences and things to shy away from. Um, and then the, the last question I had was, uh, let's see. I think it's interesting that Zoom, okay, WebEx, and Microsoft Teams okay. are all about even. So there's a yeah. Okay, um, so I, I think I shared results to everybody and we all can kind of see that and you can carry on. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm done with my poll. <laughs> all right, I got to close my thingy. All right, yeah, so one of the reasons we asked that poll is just because it's so important that, you know, you have a good set of tools, but you need more than one tool. Um, you know, you need some sort of tool that we can, that you can screen share. You need a tool with video, you need a tool with audio, but then you also need tools obviously that are actually holding your stories. And so, you know, I saw a lot of people at Excel. So it's, you know, I remember when I first started doing Agile many years ago, we literally were writing stuff on cards and then we were entering the cards into Excel. And then at a certain point we got version one and, you know, then re recently I noticed nobody answered version one. I thought that was interesting. Um, and now a lot of people are using Jira. And confluence and of course with that there are also others jira line formerly known as agile craft gets layered on top and that's a real helpful tool i think for pi planning in many situations so you have to have a whole set of set of tools because you know i'm a huge cook in the kitchen love to cook in the kitchen so but i recognize that you know a whisk has a certain use but it's not to you know flip my burger so I need a different tool for that. So you got to have the right tool for the right thing, but you also don't want to be in a situation where we have so many tools that um, people don't know what to use. So it's important just as an organization to kind of narrow yourself around a set of tools and, uh, and make sure you're kind of consistent from that perspective. But I think uh, it's, it's this idea of there are some tools for persistent communications and, and art, creating artifacts, and there's some tools for just quick, rapid, collaboration, I think there's a distinction in here, right? Right. Um, I say the other thing is just, just I'm, I'm polling and voting. I, I have, I have, do, we've just dumped in, jumped into the deep end with polling and voting. And um, I found very powerful voting tools in Miro. Um, and I've been impressed with that ability to do the voting and, 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 and in a way that's really easy. Um, serious polling in, in voting in, in, um, uh, in Zoom, for instance, is, is, is good second, but I, I found that one in, in Miro. Any other sort of voting or polling tools that this group here has seen and felt are really valuable? You know, while, while people um, think about that and definitely add the answer in chat, you know, the other thing that I would, would comment on is that sometimes using something that isn't intended, the workaround is good enough. Right, and so one of the things that a, a team that I was working on um, recently, they used, um, you know, the, the annotate little feature inside, um, it was Google Jamboard. And we were just asking people to, in one, we, we tried the plus one as, as one way of, of noting which, you know, was your preference with a particular question. And then the, the next time we tried it with just the annotate piece where you can actually put a little mark on something. Um, and, you know, the, the, it requires people to know in advance how we're going to do this, and it certainly is a working agreement. But, hey, if some people can't get a requisition through and, and approval to use something like Miro fast enough for their next PI planning session that might be coming up, so my first advice is um, take a look at what you currently have and see if there's a, a way to make it work. And I think, John, you just had an experience like that, too, where when everyone understands what the workaround is, it can be good enough for at least one PI session. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, I'll, I'll give you the example. So um, the team I'm working with right now, their JIRA configuration is a little different than I've seen in some other places, but we were trying to figure out how to identify dependencies. Since this, they had taken a team of over 100 people working as a, a, one giant Agile team and broke them into four. Well, it's probably not 100 people when I think about it, but broke it into four different teams. And so it's uh, so then they were trying to figure out how are we going to recognize the dependencies upon the other team and they actually put a label in JIRA that was basically it depends on pod one depends on pods two it's shorter than that but that's essentially what it was and for the purposes of PI planning it actually accomplished what we needed to do because we could create a very easy um, board in JIRA to see those dependencies and that led us to have the discussions that we needed to have during the PI planning session it's probably not the ro most robust it certainly doesn't 
mimic the big red string diagram that you would normally have, but it worked for what we needed to do and it got us where we needed to get in the, the day we were doing it. So sometimes you gotta be creative. Good. So yeah, so we just talked about kind of different things, video, virtual collaboration, and then instant messaging. So, and then obviously an artifact repository. So sometimes, um, you know, Artifact, let's start down the bottom, artifact repository. So a lot of times, you know, I've seen people using SharePoint or using um, Confluence, things like that. So, you, you know, you put stuff in there. It's also a great place to put your agendas and tools like that. Um, the instant messaging tool is fabulous, obviously, no matter what you're doing. I mean, we're doing it right now. Like we're, there's a chat conversation going on in the background of even this discussion that everybody can see um, because you recognize one big difference is that only one person can talk. I mean, we've got 30 people on this call right now, but only one of us can really talk simultaneously. But with the chat feature, it allows multiple conversations to be going on in the back, background, you know, sort of like passing notes in school, but different. And, um, but it also means that you can go, you know, you can't have that conversation where one person stands up and walks to the other table, you know, while there's another conversation going. So it's really important to have that, that kind of channel going on. Um, but then, you know, going back to the video tools, um, it's really, I, I personally think it's really important and it's a big challenge. I've been working with a lot of people that just don't want to turn on their cameras um, and I understand that, but it's really nice to be able to recognize people. And my, I mentioned at the beginning of this that my first PI planning when I worked at Anthem was virtual. And then, but our second one was in person. We convinced the leadership team that they needed to spend the money and bring everybody in. And this was a company where they had been working virtually for so many years. And I heard one person say, oh my gosh, I've known you for 17 years and I've never met you in person before. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of power in actually being able to have those because then people go out and they get to dinner and they have drinks and stuff like that. So I think I saw somebody in the chat, you know, they said something like, is, is this virtual thing going to be the wave of the future? And I, I really hope not. I mean, it's certainly a money saving opportunity if, if you don't have to travel every PI, but there's so much value in still getting together and having those one-on-one -on -one personal connections that you don't get any other way. And plus, mm -hmm. you don't really have, know how tall anybody is on video. Turns out that's something else you learn when you meet them in person. <laughs> yeah, I guess I would agree with you, John. What I'm hoping is that um, as, a, as a world, we start to recognize from a just even being green standpoint that I don't think it's possible that we can all keep getting on planes for the, you know, in the near-term future and flying everyone all over all the time. But, you know, every other time, and we'd save a whole lot of greenhouse gases and, and keep those connections with people and save a little bit of money and all the other things that kind of come with getting good at remote as well. Um, yeah, and I guess that I always think about what Kim said in our last webinar. So if you listen to our last um, uh, recording from last time, she said somebody told her showing up at a um, webinar type meeting with your video off is like walking into an in-person with a bag on your head and I thought you know it, there's something about that where if you set the expectation that hey PI planning is a really important thing and for this meeting this type of meeting we're going to have video on as long as people know it ahead of time I think even people who are not really fans of it I just understand that hey this is an expensive chunk of time for everybody and the stakes are high and we're going to invest everything we can in it whereas there might be other types of meetings that culturally in your company having video off is fine. Yeah. Hey, John, on, on the uh, instant messaging tools, one of the things that jumped out to me when we were having this conversation to prepare for this webinar was the thoughtfulness around the channels and how to use the channels. Can you just spend a few seconds talking about the, um, the channels and the instant messenger and, and why those are important? Yeah, and it's funny because I see this both with Slack and in Microsoft Teams, you know, that you can have separate channels to talk about it. I know here at Applied Frameworks, we have multiple different channels that arrange everything from sales and marketing to, um, to actually remote planning. And we have one specifically about remote planning. Um, same thing on my current team. Every, every team has their own uh, Microsoft Teams channel, um, which then it's a couple things. There's, you know, there's one-on-one -on -one communication there's one to many communication, which is, I think is really important. And sometimes it's really nice to get out there. You know, you go, all right, I just want my team to know what's the URL to our planning board. And you stick that in the team channel. Nobody else needs to know about it. I mean, it's not like it's a secret, but nobody else needs to know about it. Don't clutter up their messages. So it's really kind of that whole thing between how to use email, which you might want to send to everybody, but is not quite as responsive sometimes versus, um, you know, what do you want to do, communicate one-on-one -on, -one on the back channel versus what do you want to communicate just specifically with your team? And so I look at that kind of as three different hierarchies of communication, and it just really depends on your audience and who you want to communicate with. 
Yeah. You know, the, the channels that you laid out here, I think, are analogous to people raising their hand right, in, in a big room or going to seek out one of the architects or one of the product people. And, and this virtual, the virtual world, we can't do that. And so this might be that analogy to raising your hand and say, hey, architect, I need a quick consult. Here, jump into our Zoom room or whatnot, right? Right. So I think structuring those ahead of time and thinking about and, and setting expectations for folks who are in, in each of these channels, like, you know, there are general announcements, that's just consumables. But you know, if you need a, a, a product person to come and, and have a, a chat about something, they need to be monitoring that and, right. and letting folks know, okay, I'll be there. Well, I'll be there in five minutes or 10 minutes or whatnot. And one thing too, I think about the persistence of the data is also important. So for yeah. example, here we are, we're having a chat here on this webinar um, and we're, the, record, the webinar is being recorded. But if you don't go back and look at the recording, this chat is virtually gone, right? You're never going to see it again. If you want to have something that's more persistent, where you can go back and think about, well, what did we talk about? What was the actual conversation that occurred? And, you know, that sort of thing. And you want something to be more persistent that you can get back to later. Then you want to use a channel like Slack or Microsoft Teams or something like that, where it's not automatically erased at the end of the session. Yeah, for sure. All right, Laura, I'm going to let you talk about Miro or, or Kevin. You guys have been using it more recently than I have. Yeah, it's um, Kevin has probably become even more of an expert than, than we have. But you know what we really like it for is the ability to use frameworks, decision making tools, um, ways of making uh, information transparent and easily consumable by people. Miro has been really great for us and in, um, in, in providing a, a good place to do that. Um, Kevin, I, I think you can talk a little bit more about it, but the way I think about it is you can have um, a team board in Miro where the team might be working um, in a way that allows others to see what they have going on. Um, and it also allows for that kind of central repository of maybe open questions or, um, you know, it might even be a good place to do your confidence voting where you want to have a, a, a main place that everyone knows where to go look for that. So. Uh, that's the upside of Miro. Um, the downside of it is that don't underestimate how much time you'll spend setting the thing up. <laughs> right. right. So Kevin, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, I mean, Miro is 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 extremely uh, flexible, and 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 you can do all sorts of things in it, and it just just take time to set it up. Now, the good thing about Miro is they've got some some nice uh, templates that'll get you give you a head start, and especially if you're a fairly simple train and you're doing not a massive PI planning session, you can start with some of the templates and, and run with it. But if you're getting bigger, if you're getting super um, uh, super specific to your organization, you've got something, it just it takes time. I love, it's very scalable. You can, you can have a, a large, large event. And I, I haven't, just talking to some of our colleagues, I haven't run into like a magic number that hey, if you have more than a, you know, 500 people, mirror starts to grind to a halt. But, uh, for the size of our trains here uh, that we're talking about. It's very scalable. Zoom in, zoom out. That central uh, collaboration space, be any tool, is so important to keeping people focused throughout. Uh, the one thing that I love is the physicality of the string connecting uh, things on your, um, your, your, your planning board. And I love that <laughs> Miro allows us to do that uh, fairly easily. That's terrific. And if you're a Jira user, I haven't mastered this, by the way, but there's a I think it's not bi-directional, I think it's monodirectional in terms of communications uh, between, um, uh, between uh, JIRA and, uh, and Miro. So pretty Kevin, good. Let me ask cool. you this question. I, quite a bit. What about uh, people with security concerns? So I know, for example, Laura and I were just talking with it. We have a current client right now that's a bank wow. and they're, they're definitely concerned about something leaving their, you know, their enterprise, right? And so something like Miro, is that a concern and how do you address security concerns? Well, it, you know, I think that um, each each organization is going to have a little bit of different security scan on these, and um, you know, Zoom is an example. If if you start shining the light on any of these things that are used now more ubiquitously than ever, uh, you might find some. So I think that the the key advice there is to work with your security professionals um, to do uh, a bit of a a quick scan to make sure that any tool you're using, be it Miro, Mural, Weave, Zoom, whatever passes muster, but um, it is, uh, yeah, it, it, it be, be careful when you do that. <laughs> it may slow you down a little bit more. 
all the other reason to pick your tools and plan ahead of time because you're going to have to work with that in, in certain environments. Um, so yeah, that's the only thing I would ask. If you don't have an enterprise level agreement, one of these collaboration tools, you know, you might have to play with a few of them and ensure that the security folks have, have done a good job of doing a security. Scan. Yeah. I, something else I would add, I've been on the vendor side of, um, you know, enterprise platforms. In fact, I think the next one we're going to talk about was a, a product that I was involved in um, launching called Weave. And for those of you who don't often get involved in requisitioning, requisitioning software for your teams, don't underestimate how long that can take. Because <laughs> I've been on the, the flip side of it where I've been working with advocates inside a business who really want to use something and even they're surprised by how long a security audit can take. Yep. So that goes back to taking a look at the tools that you have access to and when you're doing your planning and your dry run initially, try to find things that you already have that can fill gaps for your immediate PI that's coming up and then take a look at, okay, over the long term, as a good corporate citizen and knowing what we know about COVID and all those other things, I think we should all just plan for having to be good at remote PIs and in-person PIs equally. Yeah. We should say, hey, we're equally good at both. We have a tool set to support both. And, you know, you might have to cut a few corners early on and do the best you can with what you have, but then put, you know, the requisitions in place to really look at some enterprise software. And sometimes it's easier to ask forgiveness and permission. <laughs> that, is, that is true. <laughs> Well, actually, if you if for the second one, John, I, th I think you had a really interesting way of making use of Weave. So it's a platform that we use as a consulting company, and um, it allows for anonymous participation. So this combination of anonymous participation, meaning it's you don't have to enter your email address as a participant to use it, and the working agreement that um, you know non I, I guess information that if it did get out wouldn't be a problem because it's all coded or it's code names right. for things meant that your company that is actually um, very security conscious realized that they could make use of a platform that is enterprise class, but the way they intended to use it meant that um, they could totally use it and they were completely comfortable with it supporting their PI. Right. And we were using Weave. The, the one that sh you're showing right now is, is obviously it's a PI planning tool, but we were using a Weave version uh, this week that's a sailboat retrospective. And because it, initially their answer was, no, we can't do it. And I was able to show them that, that you didn't have to enter an email address and we could use a common password. You know, it's like a three letter password or something like that. Everybody could get in, they could put their real name or they could put a fake name, they could do whatever they want. And then because it's a retrospective, there wasn't really anything classified in the retrospective items. And then I was able to do it within their, I was able to download the results within their domain and, and give it back to them. So it actually worked out pretty well. In a situation like this, you know, if you're concerned about putting highly classified details, you know, you might be as simple as just go, all right, I'm going to give the JIRA number of the feature we're talking about. And obviously a JIRA number is literally as a number. So, you know, it's nothing, right? So just put it up there and then you could use it to, to create your program board or, you know, things within your team or something like that. Um, hey, thanks, Jim. <laughs> He's jumping off. Um, so, yeah. So Mir, uh, the Weave here is actually owned by Scaled Agile, and they are building out more and more uh, frameworks into the platform. So we talked about a couple different things on Weave in the last webinar related to Three Horizons planning, pruning the product tree. You can actually run a lot of prep work um, leading up to the uh, PI planning, as well as execute on the PI planning uh, through something like Weave as well as like Miro and, and Miro are out there. So uh, there's some good tools and some good templates to get you started. And a lot of them have, you know, just free free access, a very, actually very powerful free access to get a, a, a trial going. Yeah, Miro is definitely like that. And I guess what I would say for those of you who wanna take a look at Weave, it's not a general release offering yet out of Scaled Agile, but you know, we use it as a, a consulting tool. And for example, John's company is using it through us. So if anyone else has questions about that, um, you know, you know how to reach me via email, um, definitely let me know and we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about what that might look like for you. So I know that we have five, uh, sorry, three more minutes left. Maybe we can hit some of the questions you've been collecting there. Uh, yeah, uh, so um, I think some of them have been answered in the chat by others on the group, so I appreciate that. Um, there was one specific about any experience we might've had with Microsoft Teams. John, have you used yes. Microsoft Teams? I have. I've used it in a couple of situations. Um, so I had a client um, in the fall that actually used Microsoft Teams and actually ran their 
um, their Kanban board in Teams. So they created basically a, a series of you know boards and that sort of thing. So they were actually to do that. I believe it's a plug-in and right off the top of my head, I forgot what the name of the plug is. Um, starts with the letter P. I forgot exactly. Um, yeah, but, yes. but I do think that's one of the values of Microsoft Teams is they do have this ecosystem of plugins that can start to help you build out um, what right. it can do for you. So there was that, and that my current client uses it mostly just for communication. It's mostly just they have channels. Every team has their own channel. There's obviously the one-to-one -one communications. So they're not using it from an agile perspective at all. They're just using it for channel. They're using it somewhat like you would use Slack, to be honest. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Uh, I, I think there might have been a – gosh, I think – if anyone has something um, that you want to put into chat right now that you don't think was answered quite well enough, um, if we can nail it quickly, we will. Otherwise, we'll discuss it as a, a group um, at Applied Frameworks, and we'll include answers to those open questions in our mm. email when we send out the links to this. So the one question that Jessica put in there was around um, Scrum Masters and whether you had, how do you manage when you don't have enough? I mean, clearly having enough would be the right answer. And maybe there's some good facilitators outside the company who are not necessarily Scrum Masters that could help. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is to just, set expectations with your team as a scrum master as to, Hey, I'm splitting between two. This is how I'm going to do it. And to set those expectations ahead of time so that um, people can um, adjust accordingly. Right. John. Yeah. And I've, awesome. I've seen situations where sometimes you have a product owner that's just really good at facilitation. And so what I tend to do is yeah, I, yeah. I sort of figure out like who's better at facilitation. And I go, if I have to be in two places at one time, I'm like, okay, you're pretty good at this already. So you're in charge. Call me if you need me. I'll be in the other room. And yeah. that has worked out pretty well. I've seen one actually, we had one of our directors actually yesterday or two days ago, one of the directors just was like, okay, I got time. I'll sit in this room and, yeah, and exactly. help as necessary. And he's got a lot of agile experience anyway. So he had it sort of act as, as the scrum master in one of the rooms. So um, yeah, just unfortunately you gotta be creative in that situation as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I maybe the that that last comment I would make is also breaking out the difference between logistics and managing logistics from a facilitator standpoint to true discussion facilitation, which doesn't happen 100% of the time. Um, and that might also help you split your time a little bit. Maybe there's a logistics facilitator that you would add to your team that helps with things versus the, you know, some of the, the more heavy lifting that Scrum Masters do. Well, and what I did this week too, and it's only because I have the laptop my client issued me as well as my own laptop that I get from my company here. I actually had two Zooms going on. Now you can't put two Zooms on one laptop, but I actually had two Zooms going because I had one on each side and I had one of them muted, both, you know, both directions, bi-directionally muted, but I could see what was going on, what was on the screen. I could see who was talking, stuff like that. Every once in a while I look over and I go, I can just tell that I need to jump onto that call for a moment. And so I would mute the other laptop and go jump onto the other one and have a little conversation and, and jump in. And then I'd be like, all right, I'm going back to my other one. So I literally just turn my head and go back to the other one. So if you have two laptops, that's actually, you know, a potential scenario that you could use, especially if you're using Zoom or something like that. All right. So we are one minute over. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, we would love to hear from you after this. If you have other questions or other suggestions about topics you'd like us to cover, um, I have a lot of experts in our company who like to talk about a lot of different things. So it doesn't have to be PI planning. If you have a, a topic that you would like us to discuss in this kind of format, shoot it over. We're all ears. We'd love to tackle that stuff. This is great. Hey, Thanks for everybody. I loved all the chat and, and, uh, and I love the way everybody's been participating. Thanks so much. Yeah. And Laura, where can people get the slides? Um, they will come in the email. There's a link to a slide share that you'll get once I put them up there. And there'll also be a link to the recording, which will be a YouTube link. Um, so within a day, you should get that. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great. Thanks, everybody.